Good morning. We're going to sing, stand up, stand up for Jesus. If you feel like standing up, that's awesome. We'll do verses one, two, and four. 7.30, stand up, stand up for Jesus. Verses one, two, and
Father, we thank you again for another chance to come to your house to worship and learn more about you. We'd ask you to be with those who were mentioned here this morning and give them the, the strength and the healing and the, the comfort that you can provide. And uh, also be with those who were not mentioned that, that you know about. And uh, we keep them in our prayers to be with Mark that he will find the words to bring us closer to you. In Christ's name we pray. Amen. Last song here for the message will be I'll Fly Away on 779. And we'll do all three verses of this one as well. 779, I'll Fly Away. All three. Correct? 
that one who is trouble, that one who causes problems, that one who everybody else has to look out for. And you know what else they say about families and that one in the family is that if you can't decide which one it is in your family, you're probably the one. <laughs> So let me tell you about my family. No, it's going to scare me on where it's going to end up. I've been practicing a couple dad jokes. Okay, it's good to have a few dad jokes in your repertoire. Uh, so let me share a few with you. I had a huge fight with my siblings. A friend said, well, that must be huge. No, really, it's all relative. My twin brother called me from prison the other day. He said, do you remember when we used to finish one another's sentences? <laughs> it never occurred to me how much my parents favored my twin brother until they asked me to pick up his surprise birthday cake. <laughs> my sister thinks she's so smart. She said only onions are the only food that make you cry. I threw a coconut at her and proved her wrong. <laughs> I wouldn't trade my siblings for the world. I don't have any place to put the world. <laughs> oh, family, family, family. That's where we find ourselves here in the book of Genesis. In fact, it's interesting that Genesis is a lot about family. Uh, when you consider the way that God reveals himself to us in his word, the whole story of Genesis talks about family and how God continues to move through the family and show his love and his grace through the family that is there. If you have your Bibles, we're headed to Genesis chapter 13. We've talked already about how generations uh, are a part of our family and how our faith uh, affects the generations that are there. We've talked about sin's effect uh, against our family and passing along even some family sins. We've talked about God's call in the story of Abram. And we talked about the way that he worshipped and he led his family in worship. And so today we're introduced again to another character uh, that we get to highlight. And his name is Lot. Abraham's nephew. So let's read Genesis chapter 13, the first nine verses. Genesis 13, 1 through 9 says this. So Abram went up from Egypt to the Negev with his wife and everything that he had, and Lot went with him. Abram had become very wealthy in livestock and in silver and gold. From the Negev he went from place to place until he came to Bethel, to the place between Bethel and Ai, where his tent had been earlier, and where he had first built an altar, and there Abram called upon the name of the Lord. Now Lot, who was moving about with Abraham, also had flocks and herds and tents. But the land could not support them while they stayed together, for their possessions were so great that they were not able to be together. And a quarreling arose between Abram's herdsmen and the herdsmen of Lot, the Canaanites and the Perizzites were also living in the land at the time. So Abram said to Lot, Let's not have any quarreling between you and I, or between your herdsmen and mine, for we are brothers. It's not the whole land is not the whole land before you. Let's part company. If you go to the left, I'll go to the right. If you go to the right, I'll go to the left. We know maybe some of you are familiar with the story about Abram and Lot and the way that their land is divided up among themselves. And I'll tell you the rest of how the story continues on in just a moment. But first, let's just ask the question, who is Lot? You know, what connection do we have with Lot? What can we learn from this person who is Lot? And as every good sermon has to have a title, we could call this title, Abram has a lot to lose. See, here we go. Keep the thing going. Pay attention today. All right. Uh, Abraham has a lot to gain, or maybe you could even call it save a lot. <laughs> That's what I would expect. I thank you so much. <laughs> So, and considering nephews and family, and we all have family of some situation or another, and we all have different opinions of the family that we have. And, and you ask yourself, well, here's Abram uh, with his nephew Lot. Would you take care of your nephew like this? Would well, be able to haul him around from place to place? And, you know, I like my brothers. So we still have a decent relationship with them. But their kids? I mean, uh, who knows uh, what it would be like to have them tagging around uh, that you always had to take care of uh, on again. Well, would you honor uh, the family uh, connection? Would you have payback uh, against your siblings uh, by dealing with their kids in that way? But also in the story, we have a case study in character. 
with the story of Abram and the story of Lot, we have two distinct ideas, two distinct ways that people live. In fact, some may see Abraham and Abram as being our, our example. This is the way that we are supposed to try to live like. And then we have Lot, and unfortunately, sometimes he's the mirror. He's the reflection of ourself in this story. And so as we let the story unravel, see how we relate and how they come together with one another. Abraham was a man of faith. Abraham was a giver. Abraham was wise, usually. We talked a little bit about that. We'll talk a little bit more as we unravel his character. And, and on the opposite side of it, Lot was carnal. Lot was worldly. Lot was a taker. Lot was foolish. We have two distinct characters that are part of the story. And last week we talked about Abram's faith but also his failures, how he grows in trust with the Lord, how he leaves the land without knowing. But before we get to chapter 13 and 14, maybe we need to step back and look at another fault, possibly, that Abram had. Do you remember when we talked about the call of God to Abraham when he was back in the land that he was not supposed to be in and was getting ready to move into the promised land, the land that God wanted to give him? The promise is there in Genesis chapter 12, verse 1. It says what? Leave your family. Leave your father and mother. And so maybe at the beginning of the story between Abram and Lot, we see that Lot causes a lot of difficulties with Abram in this family, is it possible that maybe by the direction that God gave him, that Abram failed, took a misstep there at the very beginning? Maybe Lot wasn't supposed to be a part of this journey in the first place. Maybe you could say that Abraham took baggage with him. And like we do on all of our trips, right? Sometimes we have a lot of baggage. Yeah, uh, uh, hey, hey. you're with me, Don, before I even got there. I appreciate that. That's good. Uh, a lot of baggage. But I want you to think about this. Several times this morning, I want you to evaluate, to apply the situation to your spiritual walk. What baggage do we also carry around in your walk with God? Many people try to add Jesus to their already busy life. It's Jesus and this, and Jesus and that. But really, when it comes down to living a life of faith, we have to realize that Jesus takes priority. And so sometimes it's not Jesus and, it's just Jesus. And maybe in this situation, even as the story of Abram unfolds, we see that Abram is trying to cram a little extra into his life that causes him problems. What baggage do you try to carry in your walk with God? Not just inconvenient baggage, not just disobedient baggage, not just deceitful baggage. It's interesting to see the stories of the things that people try to sneak in, try to smuggle in as they carry and go on a trip to come back in their suitcases to see what all they could get away with uh, by stuffing them uh, down deep in their socks and bringing it back with them in this situation. Maybe that's what's going on here as we begin this story with Abram and Lot just to present that in that consideration. So let's go back and talk about Lot. We've already mentioned that Lot was a taker. And so this morning I have three stories that I want to share at with you about who Lot is and what the situation is in their life. Here we have the story where God blesses Abram, and he has so much stuff with him. In fact, as God blesses Abram, God also blesses Lot. And maybe we could ask ourselves, does God bless Lot directly, or is Lot blessed by being a part of Abram's family? We don't know. We don't see ever where we have... Uh, even another difference between Abram and Lot is their response to God. We never see Lot talking with God. We never see Lot worshiping with God. Here already in what we read this morning and going back to last week, we had three or four different times that Abram set up an altar and worships the Lord. It never tells us that about Lot. Uh, and so well, who are we to understand the way that Lot is blessed and where he comes across with all of this possession, but they get to a point where they realize they have too much stuff. You've probably been there, right? <laughs> too much stuff in too little place. There's no more room in the closet. You have to find someplace else to go. And so they come up with a solution. They're standing there in the promised land, Abram and Lot, and they look out around them and they say, let's divide up. You go one way, I'll go the other way. You go this way, I'll take the opposite way. 
In fact, what we see here in the story in Genesis chapter 13 is that Abram gives Lot the choice. Here's the hill country, there's the plain. Which do you want? And as the Bible tells us in the story, Lot sees how beautiful the plain is and how well per, per, uh, provided for uh, with the plants and uh, the river that runs through it and, and the cities that are down there already. And Lot says, uh, I'll take that place. This is not a hard question, okay? Do you want something that's really beautiful or do you want something that is already here where we are? And Lot chooses the one that looks the best. So he takes all of his possessions and moves to that place. Now we also hear a little bit about this story. As he makes this choice and takes this place that is best, we all want you to ask yourself the question, well, what motivated Lot to make that decision? As you and I well know, that the world's best, to choose the best, typically, typically comes with baggage. Here we have that word again. And the baggage sometimes is a lot of baggage. You know, what do we hear from this story that they choose as Lot moves into this plain area where the cities are, we find out what cities are there. Sodom, Gomorrah. And we have to start reading, even in the scripture that it gives us, what it tells us about Sodom. It was a beautiful place. In the middle, there were things that were wicked. What do we know about the city of Sodom? <laughs> the shiny lights of the city were dark with wickedness. And sometimes that's the way it is even with our own situation. When we bring this baggage and we make the choices about how we want to follow God in the situations that we want to follow God with, sometimes when we get so wrapped up and looking at the things that are nice, it pulls us away from our relationship with God. If we're chasing money, it leads to investments. It leads to worry and neglect. If we're chasing hobbies, it leads to expenses. It leads to time consumption. It leads to priorities in our life. When we make choices, they all have different effects to our life, including our spiritual life as well. That's what we have here is Lot makes his choice. I want to live down here in this area. No problem except it becomes a problem as you hear of some of the stories that go along with it. Real simply, we find not just in this part of the story, but in every part of the scriptures where it talks about this city of Sodom, we know one thing about it. It's wicked. We have terms in our English language that go with Sodom. Sodom me. You know, we know from the descriptions that happen that we're going to talk about here, even here in a few weeks later, that their sexuality was deprived. Homosexuality was rampant. The reasons that God sends fire from heaven a few chapters later to destroy the city of Sodom is that they are wicked, wicked, immoral people. Lot chooses to move down to the plain next to Sodom. Every time Sodom is described in Scripture, it's about wickedness. And so we can learn from it that it is a story, that it is a picture, that it is a type of correlation of wickedness that is there to let us warn from. Sodom is even talked about in Revelation and the destruction uh, of the world and the wickedness that has come about. We just made reference even a few weeks ago in talking about the evilness that God had to get rid of once already up to this point in chapter 13 uh, with the flood. Sodom was a wicked place. So we find out from this story that Lot basically tells his family, hey, it looks pretty down over here next to these two cities. Let's go down to, and we could put our own uh, modern day twist on it, right? Let's t move down, family. We're going to go to Vegas. We're going to live there on the strip, and maybe we can find an easy job there around there. I think it'll help give you some good exposure uh, to the world that is there when you make those choices. There's baggage and penalties that come along with it. By the time that we get to chapter 13, the Bible tells us in this story that Sodom moved, or that, excuse me, that Lot moved close to Sodom. By the time that we get from chapter 13 to chapter 14, it tells us that Lot moved in Sodom. He moved close. He enjoyed the comforts of being by the metropolitan area, all the opportunities that the city had to offer him, all the chances for entertainment and good food and wonderful real estate. And as he was there, he moved from being outside of the city, being close to the city, to being into the city. Again, I want 
you to ask yourself those questions today. This is a time for self-evaluation. How does that fit in with your spiritual life? Have those been those situations in your life that you have allowed to be a part of your life? And then before you know it, it's not just a part of your life. It controls your life. Everything in your life goes around what is happening in that moment. What is your Sodom? What do you want to live closely to? And what are the harmful effects that you are not considering by being in that situation? We had a simple situation in our own family this week, uh, trying to sort a few things out. And we had to make a stand that I thought was making a stand to do things God's way. And we found out that it's not convenient. <laughs> that uh, make, sometimes doing the right thing uh, is expensive, and sometimes it takes a lot of sacrifices to do those things. And that's the situation we have here with Lot. He chooses the easy way, he chooses the convenient way, and he finds himself getting into trouble. That's the first story of a Roman Lot. Then we get to the second story. Uh, if you have your Bibles open, we're not going to read it. But chapter 14, well, let's read a few of the verses here in chapter 14. Uh, the, there's a war that goes on in the land. And sometimes when people see what ha happens here, uh, they get real frustrated about, uh, well, the Bible can be really irrelevant. But what we have basically is an invasion where one country is taking over another country. And we have, as it tells us here in 14, uh, that there is a king. His name is Kedolaomer. Maybe we could have other names. When it comes to some of the Bible names, if you say it loud and fast, you can get through it and maybe surprise everybody else. But if you have your Bibles, let's read verses 3 and 4 just to hear the setup of this second story. There were latter kings joined forces in the Valley of Siddam, that is, the Valley of the Salt Sea, the Dead Sea. For 12 years they had been subject to Kurdolamer, but in the 13th year they rebelled. So the one king had opposed the other area, and in that area was the king of Sodom and all of the communities that were there where Lot lived. And so there was a rebellion that happened after 12 years. We're going to stand up and fight and get rid of these people. And the oppression happened even worse, so much that as they invaded the place, they pillaged Sodom and Gomorrah, taking all of the people and the possessions with them far up out of the way. Well, as they did that, that also means they took Lot and his family. The Bible tells us there in chapter 14 that one of the refugees came and got Abram's attention. And Abram went all of a sudden and got his group together. It's interesting that as you read about who Abram is uh, there in verse 14, it mentions that Abram was so wealthy and so blessed that he had 318 trained assassins uh, as a part of his family, uh, as a part of his entourage. Uh, so we're not talking about just a guy in a tent uh, you know, with a few kids here. This is someone who had really established himself in the area. So Abram said, okay, we're going after him. We're going to go and get my nephew back. And he mobilized his Rambo force, and they went all the way up uh, to the city of Dan, and it, hundreds of miles that they chased these invaders up until they conquered them and brought Lot and the city back. Archaeology tells us, even to this day, you can go to the land of Israel and see a city named Dan up in the northern part of Israel that has a gate that was there, I would guesstimated at the time of Abram, it could have been a same gate that Abram walked through as he let his as he redeemed his nephew and brought him back home to where they belonged. What's well, a great story? Abraham comes back, they set the people back and turn them back over uh, to their own king so that they can go their way. But we also have here in the middle of this story where Abram redeems Lot, another interesting character, uh, a part B, if you would, uh, of this story. Uh, Abram gets blessed by this character who is called, oh, wait behind, uh, Melchizedek. If you have your Bibles open, let's read verses 17 and 8 uh, through 20 here in Genesis chapter 14. After Abram returned from defeating Kurdo Lamer and the king's ally with him, the king of Sodom came out to meet him in the valley of Shebi, that is the king's valley. Then Melchizedek, king of Salem, brought out bread and wine. He was a priest of God most high, and he blessed Abram, saying, Blessed be Abram, the God by God most high, creator of heaven and earth, and blessed be God most high, who delivered your enemies into your hand. There's a lot that happens in here, and I just want to draw attention to who this person is. Because all of a sudden we have this another million dollar name, Melchizedek, 
who shows up out of nowhere, uh, as one who blesses Abram after Abram makes this hero feat of bringing Lot back. Melchizedek is mentioned several times in Scripture. He is said to have no genealogy. We don't know where he came from. He's not a part of any of the kings that we're told of with this story. And what we have here, as he comes and brings a blessing to Abraham, Abram responds so much that he gives a tithe to Melchizedek. Elsewhere in Scripture, Melchizedek is called a priest, a king. Uh, you know, so there are some people who, when they hear the story of Melchizedek, they wonder, is this an incarnation of God who shows up to earth? You know, there are a few times in Scripture, Jacob wrestling with the angel who turns out to be uh, the Son of God that he worships in that way. Uh, Abram having a meeting with some visitors, and one of them he turns and he begins to worship that. There were some people who think, wait, Melchizedek, is this an incarnation of Jesus early on in Scripture? We don't necessarily have any information with that. Was he just another king in the area who was wealthy and who honored God most high? That's the simplistic form of what we have here. But in any case, God gives him as a part of the story to give us an understanding of the way that there is someone special that Abraham, even in all of his greatness, realizes that there is one who is even greater uh, than him. And so in some ways, Melchizedek could be a type of Christ identified with Jerusalem, the king of Salem, it tells us here in this way, an ancestor of Israel. Uh, there's a lot of stuff that you could go ahead and read further on about that. I'm not going to spend a lot more time with that this morning, but he enters into the story, and he blesses Abram. Do you see how he blesses Abram? Did you get the story? He brought out the bread and the wine. <laughs> yet again, yet another connection uh, of maybe what is happening here uh, in the promise of the Messiah that God gives in this blessing uh, to Abraham. What I want you to ask yourself is this. What is this blessing that Abram gets from God? Blessing is one of those words, right, that we want. In fact, the real question I want you to start asking, and we're going to talk about even further next week as we move through the book of Genesis is what does it mean to be blessed by God? Do you consider yourself to be blessed by God? What situation do you have to be in to receive a blessing from God? God gives it this opportunity for us to see Abram being blessed as we have a chance to see that God interacts with the people around us, we're also reminded that there are blessings that God provides us with, and we have this part here in the story. So let me back up and finish out this part of the story. We have Abram going and getting Lot, his nephew, bringing him back to the place where he came from. As that happens, the king of Sodom comes out and says, hey, thank you so much, Abram. You are such a great guy. Let me give you some gifts for going and doing all of this hero work. Abram turns to the king, of, uh, the king of Sodom and says, no, thank you. I don't want anything from you. The Bible says that Abram makes mention of, if I receive anything from the king of Sodom, someone would be able to say later on, oh, the king of Sodom is what who made Abram so wealthy and provided with him so much. Abram said, no, thank you to the king of Sodom, but then receive the blessing from Melchizedek, the king of Salem, this Messiah figure who comes into the story in this way. You know, so we have this choice here that Abram makes. The king of uh, Sodom wants to control him, wants to manipulate him in that way. But Abram says, no, 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 no. I don't want anything from you. We've already talked about Sodom and what it means and the connection of wickedness that's all a part of it. And I think even in that part, we can find some application into our own life of who we receive praise from and who we receive gifts from. And the way that when we receive those things and the connections and relationships that we have, the control that they can have in our life. Abram says no. But then God turns and blesses him through this person of Melchizedek. The last story I want to talk about is simply what isn't said as a part of chapter 14. Now that's a picture of Melchizedek and a blessing. Uh, that Lot then returns to the place that he came from. Sometimes we don't learn our lesson, do we? Lot goes back to Sodom and the wickedness that is there in Sodom. 
Just because God sends these invaders down and they destroy the city and they take all the possessions up with them, it doesn't mean that Sodom changes in its wickedness. The immorality and the people who come back are still filled with this wickedness. And, Sot and Lot still chooses to move right back into the same house. To move right back into the same place. To have the same influences that he has. He returns to the place of wickedness. The cycle of sin and rebellion are again brought about in his life. He is still unwilling to submit and repent and let God change him through discipline. And we have then this picture that Lot is a carnal man. That Lot is worldly. He chooses the world's influence instead of God's influence. question comes. What part of your life can be described as worldly? You know, sometimes we call it safety. Sometimes we call it entertainment. Sometimes we call it fun and influence and different words. But it's not a word that we use very often as Lot is considered carnal. And basically what it means to be carnal is to be not spiritual. It is to be not influenced by God, but choosing to be influenced by everything else except God. To be carnal is not to be controlled by God. So, the question could be asked, what are you holding, still holding control of? Money can be carnal. Time can be carnal. Relationships can be carnal. Decisions can be carnal. Lot leaves all of this difficulty and he goes right back to the same place where he started. The last part of the story, though, is found in the New Testament. If you have your Bibles, let's go to the book of 2 Peter, uh, there at the end uh, of Scripture, uh, after Hebrews and James, 1 Peter, then 2 Peter. 2 Peter gives us a different insight into this character of Lot that I think has an opportunity to drive a very important point home. 2 Peter chapter 2. Uh, verses 7 and 8. It's talking about false teachers. Peter is writing to the church there, talking about the way that people will pull them aside. Uh, in fact, uh, it talks about even there in verse 6, Sodom and Gomorrah. Let's start there. 6, 7, and 8 of 2 Peter chapter 2. If God condemned the cities of Sodom and Gomorrah by burning them to ashes and made them an example of what is going to happen to the ungodly, and if God rescued Lot, a righteous man, who was distressed by the filthy lives of lawless men, for the righteous man living among them day after day was tormented in his righteous soul by the lawless deeds that he saw and heard. Wait a minute. The good news is, from this story in the book of Genesis is that Lot, even at the time that Peter writes this book, it's considered a righteous person. There is grace. There is hope. God's blessing is real, even in the mistakes that we make, even in the choices that we make. When we give our hearts to the Lord and we accept uh, the blessing from Him, uh, it's a picture of forgiveness if you want to see it that way. That lot here, even at the end of his time, is considered a righteous man. Maybe that means he didn't partake in the evil that was around him. It causes all kinds of problems to he and his family. In fact, it destroys his family, uh, as we're going to read about that uh, a little bit later. But there is an opportunity, as God always does, to redeem those who are sinners, to help those who are carnal, to discipline and provide grace for those who are worldly, to give them, to take out uh, from them their heart of stone, and to give them a spiritual heart is the way that the Bible uses those words. So, three stories with Lot. Who is Lot? Who do you see as yourself in this story? You know, usually when we get to a good Bible story, we want to pick the hero, right? The good guy. No, you probably are not Abram in this story. You're a lot like Lot. You're a lot like Eve in the story before. You're a lot like Cain and his anger in the story before. You're a lot like Noah and the difficulties of that time. And sometimes when we read these stories, we're like, oh, those people are bad, but I'm good. Look at me. I can figure this out. The good news is that God can make you good and that God can provide for you in his grace the opportunity to find pleasure in his blessing. But sometimes when we go to look at our family that is the family of God, we want to look around and look at all everybody else and see their problems. Remember what we said at the very beginning. If you can't find the troubled one in your family, maybe you are that one. 
And maybe that's where we end up here as we look at the story of the life of Lot. Lot has some of the very same things that we do every day in our own lives. The choices that we make, the tanglings with sin, the decisions to not choose God all the time. But the good news is God's grace is amazing. And that's the reason that we worship. In the same way that God sends Melchizedek as a part of the story of Abram and Lot to bring blessing, God has given us a Savior. His name is Jesus. And He died on the cross for our sins to take the worldliness, to take the carnalness, to remove the sinful desires that we have in our heart and help discipline us to choose Him. And that's why we come today. We hear the story of Abram and Lot to reflect upon where we are with the Lord respond thanking you Jesus for what he has done to bring us back in that relationship with God. We come to the end of uh, our message today and an opportunity for us uh, to consider uh, what the Lord is calling you to do. And, and quite simply, maybe some of you need to move. Maybe some of you live too close to Sodom. Uh, maybe there's too many, a few things in your life that are in your way that are dragging you down and you continue to be like Lot, running back to those things instead of choosing a, a better way that God has provided for you. Maybe you're like Abram. Maybe you're out there working and trying to find something, that person in your life that you always are giving to. The good news is don't give up. Abram sacrificed quite a bit to go and, and save his nephew in that way. The great news is no matter who we are, we need a Savior. That person is Jesus, and we have an opportunity to worship Him today. We have a chance to turn our lives around. The hymn of decision today is number 330. Uh, are you washed in the blood? If you need to make a decision for Jesus, uh, if you need to surrender your life to Him to get your life right in repentance and confession and baptism, we invite you to come forward as we do every Sunday. Respond to Jesus. Hymn number 330. Are you washed in the blood? Uh, let's stand and sing the first verse. Have you been to Jesus for the cleansing power? Are you washed in the blood of the Lamb? Are you fully trusting in His grace this hour? Are you washed in the blood? closer to us and the, the opportunities and the reminders that your grace runs deep uh, and that your love for us is oh so strong. Lord, help us to respond from that love uh, back to you. Lord, give us good perspective. Uh, give us an understanding of that blessing that you continue to provide for us. We pray all these things in the name of Jesus. Amen. You may be seated. We'll continue on with our worship this morning. Uh, moving to hymn number 147, How Great Thou Art. <coughs> we'll do verses 1 and 2.
communion hymn will be 684, Precious Lord, take my hand. We'll sing it both times through. 684, Precious Lord, take my hand two times through. of the heaven by fire, and the elements will melt in heat, but in keeping with the promise, we're looking for a new heaven and a new earth, the home of righteousness. Let's pray. Bobby's been boasting that nobody can beat him in his bags, so <laughs> gotta have somebody step up. Bobby's been boasting, so practice. Yeah. I got scuffed over 
Well, you, you are human then, aren't you? I mean, the mindful Also, they're at Lady Social. I just saw that in the bulletin. Uh, next week, pay attention for more details with that on the 8th. So let's stand, have a closing word of prayer, and we'll be dismissed. Father God, thank you for the gift of Jesus. Thank you for the opportunity of worship. Thank you, Lord, for the beauty of life. We pray, Lord, for those around us who need help and encouragement, who need your healing power in their life, who need just a reminder that you still love them. Thank you for the way that you love us, and may we be an example of that love to others. Lord, help us understand your word, uh, find wisdom that you can bring to us uh, through your scripture and the leading of your spirit. Uh, Lord, please give us opportunity to enjoy uh, the blessings that you provide for us. We pray all these things.